maybe not have your gun up. Please. Oh, okay. Are you, are you on? Are I'm those? just, uh, I'm, yes, I'm on and I'm just admitting Alan. And turn on the recording. Okay, we are recording. So good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Taylor, Vice President for Programs for the Benton County Master Gardener Association. Uh, welcome to our April meeting. Uh, it's April, things are flowering outside. We're all of us getting to work in our gardens outside, but uh, just to be different tonight, let's turn our attention indoors. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Nicole Sanchez, uh, and she'll give what she calls the houseplant talk. Uh, she has an approach that considers houseplant selection and care based on a four category system that considers light and water needs of the plants. She'll talk about care, how houseplants react to seasonal cycles in the home, and also propagation. Uh, Nicole's goal for this presentation uh, to share this simple system with us, she feels it's something that would be helpful to us as master gardeners for our own knowledge, but she also believes it's a great tool to use when we're talking to less experienced folks, the people who ask us questions. Yes. Um, yes. Nicole is an assistant professor of horticulture He's and an extension agent for Klamath, Harney and Lake counties. She comes to us with a wealth of experience gained over 35 years working in several areas of horticulture. She's been involved in retail floristry, botanical garden management, and also university extension. And she's gone from big, both a, a pretty large range of spectrum, uh, being director of one botanical garden with 90 employees and a $10 million budget, and in another new botanical garden being the director and sole employee, she tells me, with a microscopic budget. She's come to Oregon State from coastal North Carolina, where she worked for North Carolina State University uh, as an area agent in commercial fruit and vegetable crop production. I can only imagine the climate shock that she had to face moving here from the humidity and hurricanes of coastal New North Carolina uh, to come to the dryness of the high desert, but she tells me she's been here five years now and thinks she has adjusted to the difference in climates. And as we know, as master gardeners, some of the most interesting questions we get are people who move here from different climates. So she has a background that'll be very helpful to us in this respect. Uh, her specialty in Southern Oregon is home and small scale commercial horticulture production and management. And her office is in Klamath Falls at the Klamath Agricultural Experiment Station. So Nicole, welcome. We're look, very much looking forward to your talk. The screen is yours. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction, Alan, and welcome to all our master gardeners from Benton County. It's nice to see so many of you here tonight. So uh, we did decide that uh, I'll try and make sure to remember to pause every so often in case there's questions or discussion. Alan will help me remember to do that. But since there's more of us than easily fit on a screen, we're gonna ask that you put your questions in the chat because it's difficult to tell if you're um, trying to talk when somebody else is talking and that kind of thing. So if you could put your questions in the chat, we might call on you to ask for follow-up or clarification, but I'll stop every so often and just check in with you and see if you have any questions. All right, can you, can you all see my screen now? I'm gonna take a minute just to move some things around so I can see it too. All right, let's give that a try. All right, so as Alan mentioned, we're gonna cover uh, kind of a, a four category system that I have learned to use to talk to folks about house plants. Um, you all might have noticed, like we did here in Klamath Falls, that the houseplant craze has not stopped. Uh, we even have a few garden centers here in town that previously didn't carry houseplants that are doing so and have even had a houseplant-centric store open just this month 
in our downtown here in Klamath Falls. It's focused all on house plants. And I have friends at the local garden centers here who tell me that as soon as they get a shipment in, all the interesting plants disappear. So you may be getting a lot of questions about house plants as well. So we'll talk about some of the considerations that we need to think about in terms of what's different about house plants than our outdoor gardens for light, water, fertilizer, soil, and temperature. So you may be able to see on the screen here that temperature is bolded where all those other things are different. And that's one thing that I want you to take away from this is that it's the temperature range in which these plants are comfortable that is the only thing that they all have in common, to be honest, okay? So they can all be categorized in that they like the same temperature zone, but once you get past that, they actually have pretty different needs, and we'll talk about how to categorize those. So this is an opportunity for someone to unmute and holler out the answer, but I am curious this is a picture from Instagram probably. So this is where a lot of our clients are getting their ideas about house plants. What is wrong with this picture? It looks great, it's beautiful. Anybody have any ideas? The peace lily does not take bright light. Good, I think um, it might've been Nancy that said that. Yes. Yes. So you're right on target with that. I also see several uh, Sansevieria and the Silver Queen Aglaonema next to that piece lily doesn't prefer bright light either. So uh, keep in mind that this is what the folks that come to us see. They see these pretty displays of stuff that looks great, that's very attractive and appealing, but it is also got house plants together that are not gonna survive in the same condition. So it's always helpful to remember that if they're newly coming to this, this is maybe the kind of information that they're coming from and the perception of what they have here. The other thing from a designer standpoint that really bugs me about this particular picture is that almost all of the plants have really long, narrow, linear leaves with the exception of the two off on one side. They're all very long, strappy leaves. And I submit that there's a lot more diversity out there in the house plant world. We could have something that trailed down. We could have something with some heart-shaped leaves, um, a little more variegation or something like that. So I think it's it looks pretty cool, but there's also not a lot of variation in leaf shape. All right. So let's talk about light for a few minutes. Here's another thing that I've picked up on that a lot of our homeowner clients are not picking up on. And you might recognize the same conversation from recent ones about starting seeds this time of year, right? So our full sun in our homes is about one-tenth of what is happening outside. So the brightest light in our own homes at a bright window in full sun is probably about 1000 lux, which is an updated measurement of light. You know, they used to use the foot candles. Now it's in lux, okay? So when we're outside in the sun, that's 10,000 lux. And in a window in our home, the best we're gonna get is about 1000. So, what is bright sun or bright light outdoors and what's bright light in our homes are, are actually pretty different things. So this comes into play with our vegetable seedlings, right? Where they're just stretching and straining for that light because their idea of a bright light is not the same as our people idea of a bright light when we open the blinds up. So there are lots and lots of ways that we can add artificial lighting for folks that want to be, want to take it to that level. Um, and this would play into your plant choices as well. Either you're gonna work with the light that you have or you're gonna add light, right? Those are the options that we have. So if you have not the budget or desire to add artificial light, then we wanna keep um, our plant selections, those that are gonna work with the light we have. So we'll come back to that concept. 
And then another thing to consider is that the day length is actually what triggers the bloom for a lot of these plants. So um, in my kitchen, I have a little bay window over my sink where all the orchids and African violets live because that's a place where they can respond really well to the natural cycles, the shorten, shortening and lengthening of the days that can get them to bloom when it's time. And I've been moderately successful with being able to do that. Poinsettias are another example of a house plant where the bloom is going to be triggered or uh, initiated by a certain amount of days with a particular length. So we have our short day bloomers and our long day bloomers. So it can be helpful to make sure people realize that, you know, we get questions about why my African violet never blooms. Well, if it's in a place where it's getting artificial light at night or where that light um, cycle is being disrupted, that can change whether the plant is going to bloom or not. Another thing that we want to consider, even with our light being less in our homes, is this idea of filtered versus direct light, right? So we have plants like Sansevieria. Sansevieria grows in tropical rainforesty type areas, kind of as a ground cover, right? So you can imagine that it would be in its natural habitat, it's going to have a lot of filtered light. It doesn't do well in direct light. Likewise for African violets. Um, and then one more thing about our windows and our light and something else to think about relative to whether we want to invest in artificial light is what that proximity to the window might mean in terms of temperature swings. So this is gonna be more prevalent um, maybe in older homes where there's some leakage around the windows or people that um, burn wood in their homes and might keep windows cracked to keep the air flowing through. Um, and I'm also talking about proximity to the, to the window in terms of touching the window. So I've actually had plants freeze where I, they were too close to that window. It got really cold at night. And then the next morning, everything that was touching the window was itself had cold damage, right? So much so that I could actually see it the next day. It was very sad. So we want to keep all of those things in mind when we're trying to figure out light and where we're placing plants. So I'll pause here in case there's any questions. I don't see any in the chat. Is it looking good, Alan? Yep, I don't see any. I don't see any questions either. All right, so... Moving on to water, uh, leaf thickness is an indicator of moisture retention. What do you folks think is the number one cause of houseplant death? <laughs> Somebody can unmute themselves and holler it out. I know Too you're over watering. Overwatering. Yeah. Over yes, yes, we overlove the poor things, right? And I've been guilty of it myself. So one of the things we can teach ourselves is that that leaf thickness is an indicator of moisture retention. So the ultimate in thick leaves that retain water are the cacti and the succulents, like you see in the picture here. They don't need water very often. We also have things that have tubers, right? So a lot of our begonias, for instance, and even spider plants have water storing tubers in the bottom. And so it can be challenging to get to know uh, how often water needs to be applied because they're using that. And they're using that water that's reserved in those tubers or in the case of the cactus in those leaves. And here's the thing that challenges a lot of newbies. And some of you all have probably seen this. The plant looks fine. The plant looks fine. The plant looks fine crash, it's dead, right? You don't get with the cacti, um, you don't get the warning signs that tell you to back off of the water. They just take it all until they just can't do anything with the water and they tend to just kind of fall apart. And it may seem like it's happening overnight, uh, but it's actually been going on for longer than we think. So in the house plants, this is where we have the ability to use our soil or our media 
to manage our water drainage much more easily than we would in outdoor containers or in raised beds or in garden beds. So we can get really specific with the blend of uh, parts of the media that we use and those will will help us either cling on to a lot of water in the media or not. All right, and then even when we have them inside of our homes, the plants will respond to seasonal changes. So what you find is that many of our house plants will go into a little bit of a resting period, not a dormant period, but not a period where there's a lot of active growth either. And so their water use will really drop off as our days shorten in the fall. You know, here at this latitude and where you all are as well, that change is not a tiny imperceptible change, right? In the spring and the fall when the day and night ratio is changing, it's really changing right now, right? It's earlier every day. The plants pick up on that even in our homes. And so we want to taper our water off in the fall and then taper it back up in the spring. In response to that, that would be really helpful for the plants. We can really overwater if we just keep throwing that water on them in the fall and the winter when they're trying to rest for a little bit, right? Because they're not actively growing and taking that up. I laugh at this next one here about um, the top of the soil dryness doesn't mean dryness. That is a direct quote from Mr. Anderson who ran Anderson's nursery and garden center where I spent a lot of my formative years. And he used to run around just so frustrated because they didn't give out college degrees in watering and he really felt like they should. But if he could just get somebody to water right, he could retire and start fishing in Florida on a regular basis. And apparently he finally did because that's where he's at now. But the right amount to water, right? So you can't, with your house plants, you can't just look at the top of the soil and say, oh, that's dry. I need to add more water. You really want to look down below, get your finger dirty, stick your finger in there and see what's going on below the surface because just because it's dry on the top does not mean that we need that water within the bulk of the root ball, right? And so that's pretty different from what we might think about in container gardening out in our yards. You know, I just had a do-it-yourself greenhouse. I converted the deck off of my master bedroom into a DIY greenhouse. So it's got twin wall on it, right? So I'm gonna water the stuff in there those pots are gonna to have to be watered like every day. It already gets up to a hundred degrees in there during the day, right? That is a very different situation from this. So in there, when I see the top of that soil dry, I'm gonna grab my watering can, but I'm not gonna do that same thing with my house plants. And then another thing to keep in mind is how much a lot of our house plants enjoy humidity, which is not the same as soil moisture, although I have had some folks kind of conflate the two when we start talking about plants. So you'll see recommendations for a lot of plants to put them on a tray with some gravel and have water that is not such that the water's in the gravel, the gravel's holding the pot up so that it's not actually sitting in water, but that, that you've got water around it. Um, I myself have had better success with just a mister bottle and knowing those plants that really enjoy to have that moisture, just giving them a light mist on a regular basis. Um, and again, that is something that can help mimic what is going on in their natural habitats where they're collecting some of their moisture from the air. So we do have some plants that particularly appreciate that. Pro tip, it's not the ones that have the super thick leaves that are letting you know they are already good on their moisture retention. It's not those. Grape ivy is an example of one that really appreciates that. Once those grape ivy leaves dry out, that's like the end of them, right? Like they, they get hard to turn back around. Ferns are another example. Almost all of the ferns will really appreciate that extra humidity in the air. All right, questions? Have you found any of the uh soil moisture meters, soil probes, uh, useful? No. <laughs> okay. 
Um, there's probably some expensive ones out there that actually work, but I haven't, I've been suckered by some of the less expensive stuff that I thought was junk um, and not willing to buy into some of those more expensive ones. And my finger is free and works pretty good. And the scrubbing brush at the sink get, takes care of the media that I got under my fingernail. So I have found that that works very well for me. Are there other questions? That's a good segue. I don't see anything in the chat. So relative to water, you know, there's a lot of watering gimmicks out there for house plants as well. And I did um, probably about, oh, it was before I moved to Oregon. So it must have been about seven or eight years ago. I uh, went through a phase where I played with a bunch of those different watering things. And I have to say there wasn't any of those that I tried that I was overly impressed with either. Um, I am a big fan of watering some of my plants from underneath though. So you can see the um, picture here that has that gravel like I described to you on the last slide. When it's time to water, I might just raise the water level and let the plant drink up from the bottom there. And then later on in the day, uh, if it hasn't gone below the level where the pot is, I might dump some of that water out. Now, obviously that's only going to work for plants that have a good root ball that's going down to the bottom of the pot, right? That bottom watering isn't gonna work for things that are young or, who, or that don't have a well-established root system yet. Um, but particularly um, when we have things that do get a really hefty root ball on them that starts to take up a lot of the soil, watering from the bottom can be a more effective way to make sure that you get the water everywhere it needs to go. Now, you might be thinking, well, if your root ball is that robust, is it maybe time to propagate that? And the answer would be, it depends, which is the answer to about 87% of horticultural <laughs> questions. So there are some houseplants that actually perform better and will bloom more often if they are root bound. So I'm not gonna be in a hurry to repropagate everything just because it has a nice full root zone on it. Uh, sometimes, that is what will get you the blooms that you're looking for. And then the center picture here is a self-watering container. I think it retailed for like 70 bucks. And again, this one is here. You guys might be silently laughing at it already, even before I say anything about it. But again, I put these here to remind you that as master gardeners, <clears throat> what we're dealing with is the things that people see on the internet, right? So I see about one, two, three, four, it looks like maybe like seven different kind of herbs in there. One of them is mint. So you already know that they just stuck all that in there for the picture, because if this was the real world, all the other stuff would have already been strangled. And there would be <laughs> nothing left but mint. Are you guys with me so far? Seriously though, um, this is gonna to lead to nothing but trouble. That stuff is so crammed in there. There's not gonna be any airflow. Um, some things are more vigorous than others. There's dill in there. It, that might be a, a type that gets like four feet tall, planted right next to either like some thyme or marjoram there that's gonna stay pretty small. So this is not something I would recommend, but again, reminding you that Sometimes the folks that um, are coming and asking us questions have seen things that, um, that don't necessarily convey the reality of growing this stuff. And so it's helpful to think about tactful ways that we can point that out um, without, you, you, you all know what I'm trying to say here. We don't wanna put down somebody's interest in house plants. It's awesome that they wanna grow plants, but, um, we can point them to better sources for resource information than some of these pictures that suggest things that just frankly aren't gonna work out for them. All right. Uh, before you move on to uh, fertilizer, uh, Jana asks, what about glass balls? 
that you can fill with water so the plant can draw water as needed. So, you know, several folks have given me those and <clears throat> I think they're beautiful, but I don't think they're that effective. Sometimes they get in the way of the plant, but I have several that I like, but I, I have them more ornamental. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that, let's say you have five plants with five of those balls in them. You still have to like individually check each one and change it. They're going to be taking it at different times. To me, it doesn't, because you still have to check them. And sometimes with the paint, the different colors in them, it's hard to see how much water's in there. It doesn't seem like much of a labor saver to me, which I think is supposed to be the intention. However, I think they look awesome and I actually really like the ones I have, but I don't think they help that much. Sorry. <laughs> and Deborah asks, so when does one water? Is it too late to water when the leaves are drooping? So that's a, a, a tricky sign there with the leaves drooping because um, things like peace lily and the aglaonemia, their leaves will droop when they're too wet too, or when they've been too wet. And so um, just something to keep in mind there. It's not ideal for us to wait till the leaves droop and some things don't respond very well to that, right? So some things will bounce right back when you give them the water. Spider plant, for instance, is gonna be pretty forgiving and pop right back up. Um, something like your grape ivy, Pilea, the plant called Pilea, boy, I let one of mine dry out not too long ago and it still hasn't forgiven me. I had to trim a bunch of it off, got the leaves got real dry around the edges. So back to the first part of your question, how does one decide how often to water, I think? So I always look for uh, what is going on about an inch into the soil or like up to my first knuckle on my finger. I'll actually put my finger all the way in there. And a lot of times I'll lift the pot up or kind of tug on the pot to get a feel for the weight. And that's gonna give me some idea of how saturated that soil is all the way down. Um, and then in general, your highlight plants are gonna drink a little bit more, um, but that ties into that kind of question about um, the four categories that we'll get to and kind of understanding which category you're in. So for instance, um, ferns are gonna need moderate watering, they're going to benefit more from a mist and water combo to help keep those leaves from drying out. Um, those are going to be, your ferns are going to be watered more often than an African violet, most likely, right? So there's not one answer. It depends. See, 87% of all horticultural questions. Well, I do have one last question here, and this concerns a uh, ficus benjamina, if I mm -hmm. pronounce that right. Yep. Uh, Mine recently lost 70% of its leaves. Yep. All right, so um, some common reasons why a ficus will do that. Ficus notoriously do not like to be in a draft. So if you have moved it to where it is um, like next to the front door and every time somebody comes through the front door it gets like a blast of cold wind or something like that. It doesn't like that at all, no drafts. It also will typically lose some leaves by nature in the fall. It's not unusual for it to have a leaf drop in the fall, not like all of them, like a deciduous tree that's losing its whole canopy, but more like the leaf drop on conifers that we're not supposed to notice, right? They lose just a few of them. Um, so that, that is possible. They also don't respond well to um, fireplaces uh, being close to a heat source, like if it gets moved, the, the trick with those is when you find the place that it's happy, that's the place it wants to be forever. They do not respond. <laughs> they do not respond well to being moved. And so sometimes, you know, it, maybe it's happy at the garden center where you got it and it's not as happy in your new spot. They also do appreciate some misting. Um, when the leaves dry out, they'll drop leaves really quick in response to drying out too. So whereas um, spider plants, 
African violets, snake plants, when, you know, when those dry out, the leaves don't fall off. If your ficus dries out too much one time, a bunch of the leaves are gonna fall off and then it takes some time to get that. So I can't speak to the exact reason why yours lost a lot of leaf, but there's a variety of reasons why they might do that. Um, the misting can help with that particular um, plant as well. They seem to really appreciate that humidity. I used to work in uh, at that Anderson's Garden Center back in on the East Coast. One of my favorite assignments was to get, we called it the pit. It was a big room that you went down a couple steps that had like a um, fake water feature going through it, you know, and that's where all the house plants were. And there was all these like diagonal windows so they could get sun. And uh, the ficus always did better when they were closer to the water. Even though we sprinkled a lot of them and misted them, the, the ones that were close to the water were always the happiest ones. So I think they really like the humidity. All right, are we good on questions? I think we are. Awesome. All right, so because our house plants respond to seasonality, their fertilizer needs are gonna vary with the time of the year too. So typically um, I don't fertilize at all after like the end of the summer, August, September, no fertilizer again until this time of the year. They just don't get it those six months of the year. A lot of those plants are, are, are resting. It's not dormancy, but more like stasis, right? Um, depending on what you're trying to achieve, you may find that a little bit of fertilizer on a regular basis is helpful, but not at necessarily at the full strength that um, like say Peters or miracle Grow might recommend, right? If you're mixing up the blue juice and the powder, maybe at a, at a lighter recommendation. And I say it depends because maybe you want the plant to grow a whole lot or maybe it's a ponytail palm and it's already eight and a half feet tall and you maybe don't want it to get a whole lot taller. So um, again, because these plants are containerized, we can manipulate the situation just a little bit. Um, slow release fertilizers can be really helpful if you think about uh, adding one of those in the spring, right at the beginning of the growing season, that's going to be enough to carry you through the whole year because they don't need it in the fall and the winter. And so you can add it one time and kind of be done on your more established plants. If you are um, trying to encourage blooms on things like Glexinia, your um, orchids, your African violets and those types of things, as you all know, that middle number can be helpful for that. And then for a lot of these plants after they bloom is another time to reduce fertilizer. So if you're adding the um, water-based fertilizer on a regular basis, typically you wanna cut back on that after the bloom period has happened. A lot of the plants go into a rest period after that. And then um, a comment here about amendments as fertilizer. So, Again, we have folks um, looking at things like um, worm compost products, for instance, right? And they're not supposed to be sold as a fertilizer. There's a, most of the um, worm compost products or things that we might use in our garden as organic amendments in the soil. In a container, they, so, let me say this a little bit better. In a container, if it's an organic based thing, sometimes we can get too much water retention, right? Too much organic matter, too much rotting, too much water retention, and it leads to rotting. With some of the other amendments that we might add to our flower beds, those ones that are organic amendments, remember that it takes them a long time to break down in our gardens into a form that's usable by the plant. That's gonna be multiplied in a container that's in your house. So <clears throat> things that we might think about like bone meal and cottonseed meal and feather meal and all manner of things that we might add to a raised bed outside are not necessarily gonna be as helpful for us um, in the container situation. I hope that makes sense.
All right. So um, a little bit more on our soil here. So soil is dirt, or it was dirt at one point in its life. This media that we have now, houseplant media, you will may see it sold as soil, but media is typically got known percentages of different types of material, right? So our peat moss, our sphagnum moss, perlite, vermiculite, all these different things. There's typically a known ratio of those things in a media. And you know, you've been to the garden centers, you can see the wide range of different soils that are available to us. And so uh, you can get, for instance, a soil that's better for your cactus and succulents. It's gonna have way less of the things like peat and sphagnum that really hold on to the water and a lot more of the things that are going to increase your drainage. Um, so the organic matter is there to help us retain water and to help build that soil. One of the things that we've been seeing, um, and I, I've actually picked up that other folks are seeing this too, is that the rise of the mycorrhizal soils. So you can buy um, potting soils now with the mycorrhiza already in them that you know we know that these fungal bodies are helpful and they have all these different um, symbiotic relationships with our plants. But what we're finding is that because those soils are not sterilized, otherwise it would kill the mycorrhizae, right? Way more high incidence of fungus gnats in these soils. So that's just something to be aware of. And that is also a function of there being a lot of organic matter in a lot of those. So that can be helpful to know. Um, there seems to be some debate about how a layer of different things in the bottom of the pot either sucks up the moisture and wicks it up or does not help the pot drain. Have you all seen some of the different um, schools of thought on that? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I, I see Alan nodding his head. Yes, definitely. Right, so um, I don't wanna start, I, I think uh, that's one of those that you could probably find like equal numbers of papers that support putting things in the bottom versus not, depending on how far back you want to go. I will say that with really large containers, um, if you think you're gonna need to move it or if you have visions of moving it inside and outside that um, pine cones can be really helpful to fill up a lot of the bottom of the pot so it's not quite so heavy to try to move and may um, participate in that drainage part. Of course, as those break down, there's going to have to be more soil added. And then um, making sure that folks know that if they see those white rings on their pots, those are the salts that are being extracted there. That's uh, deposits of salt. It could mean that they're using too much fertilizer more than they need. And we know that um, the clay pots are notorious for uh, attracting those white rings, right? So those are the salts that are being drawn out of the soil and the fertilizer. Sorry about that. All right, temperature. Again, this is the one thing that all of these plants have in common, temperature. So anytime there's an extreme, whether it's too high or too low, it ends up in some kind of problem. The reason we call them house plants is because they like the same temperatures that we like in our houses, just kidding. But somewhere in that 55 to 80 range is actually the ideal range for almost all of the things that we think of in house plants. Now, as we get down below 55 into the 50s, and some of them will tolerate very high 40s, they're just gonna sit there. They're not gonna grow. They'll just sit there and survive in those cold temperatures there, no active growth. And something that tricks a lot of new folks is that cold damage effects can be delayed. So think about these leaves that are highly succulent, like <clears throat> the ficus leaves in the top picture there. Because those leaves are so thick and that waxy cuticle, you may not see 
the cold damage right away. It might take it several days before you can see it all the way. It on something like a poinsettia, cold damage shows up like the next day, right? It's going to show up like really quick, but not so on everything. And then look at the aglaonema there, that cold damage to the trained eye might show up as cold damage, but somebody else might just think what's wrong with my plant. It just doesn't have that same like vigor or vitality that it had before. And then on the bottom there um, with the Dracaena, those are actually signs of too much heat. So those things can actually get too warm. So the biggest thing is um, knowing that that cold damage is going to show up anytime you start getting under 50s, depending on the plant. And so like here in Klamath Falls in the summertime, we frequently have nights that drop at, down into the low 50s, sometimes maybe even high 40s, even in the middle of the summer here in Klamath Falls. Um, you all might be a little luckier than that over on your side of the mountains, but people put plants out on patios and uh, porches and that type of thing for the summer. Some of these probably need to be brought inside. All right, so this quadrant management system that I have found helpful to talk to folks about is all about what are your options with light and then picking things that fit that situation rather than going to the store and picking all the things that you think look cool that actually aren't gonna work well together if you only have one spot, right? So um, in my house, it, the back of the house faces the south and that's what gets all of the sun. There are zero windows on that side of the house. Actually, there's, I got one plant in one window, but you know, the kids don't get any plants in their windows. They're not gonna take care of them, right? And there's so like, there's no windows in my house where the best light is. All my good windows are on the front of the house, which is much shadier. So that's why things like African violets and orchids do so great in my kitchen window. They don't get any like bright, hot sunlight. They're not on that side of the house, all right? So I understand what my options are in my home or the space that I have to work with. So we've got our, on one end of the spectrum there, our highlight, high water thing right? So all those palms, they like a lot of light. They like a lot of water. They like to grow. They don't like to sit still and, and not, um, not expand, right? Then you've got things that like a lot of light, but are low on the moisture end of the spectrum, right? So this is where all our cactus and succulents come in. Then you've got your low light, low moisture. So all those things that like low light, but also have those succulent leaves, those are going to do better where you have less light and be um, easier for folks who don't want to take care of them a lot. Then we've got things like with the low light and higher moisture, like all those ferns. If they're going to be successful with ferns, they're going to be misting them or putting them in a shower or something like that over time. O over time, the ferns are just not happy if they're not getting that moisture on their leaves. So. I have found that that's really helpful to help people kind of narrow their choices down when they're thinking about what they might want to grow. Um, you know, I really like the house plants. We've actually converted our garage into kind of a grow room and I've got different lights in different places and that kind of stuff. Um, but not everybody's going to want to add light. So if you're working with what you have, then you wanna go backwards from that and think about what are the plants that fit this space. And then within your high light or low light, you know, those different moisture levels represent different amounts of watering and care too. So maybe some of the harder things might appeal to someone who really wants to nurture the plant. And some of these things that can tolerate low moisture might be more appealing to someone who doesn't wanna invest quite as much time. Right, so bird of paradise, spider plants, all these palms, ponytail palms, all of these like a lot of light, right? In this picture with the palm, so you've got the parlor palm here. This is another one, it does not like to dry out. It starts getting all black on the edges of the leaves, starts looking all ratty when it dries out, really likes that mister bottle. 
And then next to it is the ponytail palm. The ponytail palm is way more versatile, right? It can take up a lot of moisture, but it stores it in that giant um, kind of bulbous area at the base of the stem. And so it's a lot more forgiving if you don't water it as often. It'll grow really fast if you keep the moisture on it. But if you want to keep it a little bit smaller um, and cut back on the moisture, it's more forgiving. All right, then we've got highlight low moisture. So your jades, all the peperomias, my you know, emerald repel peperomia, watermelon peperonia, pepperon <laughs> peperonia, uh, anything succulent, all that stuff that's really popular right now, highlight low moisture. Now remember, that's highlight in our homes. If I was to put that peperomia outside in full sun, I would fry it up in a single afternoon, right? It's the highlight in our homes. All right, so then we have our low moisture guys, high uh, filtered light. So African violets like this, the begonias like the filtered light. There's so many awesome begonias out there. Aloe veras can, uh, some of the aloes can tolerate some sun, they can also burn if they get too much direct sunlight and get kind of a really odd cast to their leaves. So they do like um, just a little bit of filter to their light. And then all those things that like really high moisture, right? So this is where uh, the ferns fall into this category. Um, that's probably the biggest group for this, but this is just kind of a way to think about that. All right, I think that's a good place to stop for questions before we dive into propagation just a little bit. Okay, Nancy has a question in the chat. She has a Calathea hybrid that has been happy in a low light room with a plant light, but suddenly the leaves are curling and turning brown on the edges. The soil doesn't feel not too dry. I hope I said that right, but that's what I'm reading. So, um, I don't know if the soil ever felt not too dry. It is possible that it doesn't show up right away. So plants are good at, at hiding that. Oh, she's showing me a picture. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can. Oh, it does look like it might have dried out. It's been in the same place all the time. Yep. That would that would be my guess on that one then. I'm sorry. Right. Hey, That's my daughter's plant, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully it'll spring up. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Nancy. Thanks. So um plant propagation, some folks think it's super easy. Other folks have found it frustrating. So um Probably the reason why things don't seem to work consistently is because of timing, right? So we talked about how plants have that natural cycle, even though, and they're responding to what's going on with days lengthening and shorting, shortening, even though we might not be picking up on that. So this is an area where um, in my spare time, I've been doing a little research and I would uh, welcome you all to to send things my way. If you find really great references on really specific things about houseplant propagation. And what I mean by that is like specific along the lines of the ball red book type of specific. So you can find all kinds of references that are like, yes, you can do this with a stem cutting and just cut it and stick it in the water and it works great. It works great sometimes. <laughs> Other times it doesn't work so great. And it's the same plant, it's the same jar of water. What's different is maybe the time of year. I'd like to dig into that a little bit. Let's take this snake, uh, snake plant. You see these leaf cuttings here. So this is pretty fascinating. And we did this as a um, propagation lab for our master gardeners. So we had some of these snake plants you can take these leaf cuttings and as long as you dip the right end in the root propagation powder and put it in the soil, then it should develop roots and send up new leaves. Has anybody done that with snake plants? 
You want to know how long they sat under the grow light in my office before we started seeing new leaves on them? 15 months. <laughs> I was like, well, they're not dead. I'll keep misting them down. And then about 15 months later, I was like, whoa, I can't believe it. So then they started doing their thing. And once they started sending their leaves up, you know, we had snake plants, right? So when we took those up and potted them up, all the cuttings were still kind of like separate, but now they had roots on them. So I took all the cuttings and re-stuck all of those cuttings with roots on them. It only took them about six months to turn into plants the second time. Does that make sense? So I used the same cuttings they had. They did have quite a bit of roots underneath of them, right? So, you know, that's a really long time and that's a recommended uh, propagation that you see for that particular plant is to take leaf cuttings of it. And you can also divide it, right? Um, but they can be really, really slow. And uh, some of the references that I've seen don't indicate at all that it should be taking months and months. And these were dipped in hormone and everything. So that's pretty interesting. Likewise, um, with the begonia cutting that you see there. So this is an example of a leaf cutting where they've taken like a razor blade. That was my parrot. They take a razor blade and they actually cut across the veins and pin that leaf down and keep it in good contact with the soil there. And as you can see, that mother leaf, if you will, is kind of dying and crumbling and decaying. And then the plants, the new plants are coming up from that. This is another process that can take deceptively long. So my experience is that a lot of the books out there make it seem like this is some super easy thing, just like throwing some pothos in a cup, right? And you're going to have roots in a new plant in no time at all. A lot of these really work, but the thing is they take a little bit more work and effort than a lot of the literature implies. So for that begonia leaf to propagate like that, you're gonna have it pinned down to the soil with like a fern pin or some bobby pins, and you're gonna have that soil evenly moist all the time, probably underneath of one of those um, propagation tops like you do for starting seeds to trap the humidity in there because there's no roots. The humidity is going to be really, really important while that's developing. And then if you let it dry out too much one time, it's done. And then however much time it was, the party's over. So all of these things are possible, right? Division, pretty easily possible. Leaf cuttings and stem cuttings, they're all possible. I would encourage you to play around with these and play with them at different times and different methods. And eventually, you know, I'm gonna find, either find or make the right reference that really digs into the specifics of these. Why is it that, you know, for the 20 times I've done a begonia leaf like this, it's worked five out of those 20 times. What am I doing wrong the other 15 times, right? I, I really, my curious science brain really wants to know that. And then um, a last word on propagation when thinking about how we talk to our clients about this, a lot of the newer house plants out there that have the snazzy colors, the cool variation, the cool begonias that are out there, these are all patented plants that we should not be propagating as master gardeners to sell or as homeowners if you read the patent information correctly. So, you know, that can be kind of hard to bring to people's attention sometimes, but sometimes you can just kind of make sure that's in there and then go into the methods as long as it's a plant that's appropriate and still talk about it. We, we're not regulators, we're educators. So we can just let people know what they do with that information is on them. But um, if we're propagating plants for sale or for uh, master gardener sales, you don't wanna propagate any of those newer varieties that are patented, all right? So you're probably familiar with division from, uh, even if you haven't done it with house plants, this looks very similar to how we would dig and divide perennials. So a lot of those plants like the spaths and 
um, cast iron plant, aglaonemia, Schaeffler, even all of these can uh, can tolerate division fairly well. Leaf cuttings. <clears throat> If you're going to actually cut and slice the veins, then those leaves like the begonia with the palmate veins work the best. And you slice it or cut it or pin it right at those veins to make sure that that wounded place on the vein always has contact with the soil. If you're doing like the jade or the hen and chicks leaves like you see up there in the corner, just be aware again that this is a can be a slower process that takes some time and then it's like all of a sudden you see things there right it's going to take some time the um indoor growth stores that have popped up actually have a wide range of different rooting hormones so back in the day we had root tone there's like 57 different kinds of rooting hormone that are available out there now the master gardeners here in Klamath really prefer some of the gel types. They say that it sticks to the stem better when they poke it in. They feel like it stays better as opposed to the old timey root tone that they felt like when you stuck the stem in the soil, all the root tone like got pushed up to the top and they questioned whether it was making good contact. So they really um, have grown to like the gel types here. So uh, just keep in mind that We've played a lot with different propagation here and our experience has been that a lot of these things happen more slowly than a lot of the popular things that you would find on the internet would lead you to believe, right? So our stem cuttings work best for our trailing plants. The biggest thing here is that you have to have at least one node under the water or the soil in order for that to work. So. The pilea that you see in the first picture there is not actually ideal for doing a stem cutting in the soil because the nodes are so far apart, right? And then you, if you're doing that in a flat, you're really only going to be able to get like one node under the soil. Whereas if the nodes were much closer together, you might be able to strip off two sets of leaves and then have two different places where the roots can come out. So if you if you have the option and you're choosing material uh, to root in soil, you really want something that has the nodes more close together than what we are seeing here. All right, so it looks like I'm right on eight o'clock. I will stay and answer questions for anybody who likes it. But again, my um, talking with people over the years with houseplants, um, some things that I've realized are that when we talk about all the different types of plants that are out there, it's the fact that they enjoy the temperatures that are common to our homes that ties them all together. If we're making recommendations for folks, understanding what their options are in terms of light and how much they are willing to invest, how often they want to water, how often they want to check the soil, those types of things can help lead them to decisions for plants that are best for their situation. Slow down on that fertilizer and water in the winter. And it is true that if you talk nice to them, the plants respond to that. They appreciate a positive, complementary environment in which we build each other up, just like people do. Nicole, we do have a couple of questions about propagation. Um, Jana asks, how best to air layer for plants that have gotten leggy? So um, some plants that respond well to air laying would be like your rubber plant, right? And again, I think there's some timing involved there. I would recommend doing that when the plant is actively growing, right? So in the spring, I don't think I'd recommend doing that in the fall. And there's a variety of things that you can pack around it. There's even some pods now that you can purchase. You might've seen them um, on, on the internet where you can kind of clip them on. You've got to keep that moist. It's got to be sealed up. You can't open it up and check to see if there's any roots and then seal it back up. You gotta just seal it up really tight and keep it nice and moist. And when the roots start to come out to the edges, then you'll know. 
Um, so, you know, air layering is another one that takes some time. If you have the space and the plant is amenable to it, um, you know, you can use the same type of layering like you might do for a camellia too. So um, if you just are like, maybe if the plant's too big, but you want part of that plant, it has some kind of sentimental value or something, you can actually pull a stem down and pin it into a soil in a pot next to it, right? And let it root in that soil and then cut it off like you would for a camellia or something like that outside. Um, I've seen that done successfully, like in the botanical garden world where we're trying, you know, that plant's too big for its spot and Anyways, it is possible to do it that way, as well as the air layering. My experience is that's quicker, but it's also ungainly in terms of space, unless you have a lot of working space for it. What type of lighting can be recommended for the average houseplant? Many times I get questions about lighting. So um, this is another place where I have really, come to appreciate the indoor grow stores. And they are just not only for cannabis anymore. I just dropped a hundred bucks in one for my house plants, I'm telling you. So in terms of like great nursery pots, nice indoor pots that are functional and heavy duty, but don't cost me an arm and a leg, uh, Jiffy pellet pots, and really knowledgeable people about the lighting options. You know, so, uh, understanding that there's light like what we would want to put our blooming plants that light under is different than what what we would want to put um our our green plants right because actually the spectrum of the light can induce flowering or not or not right so we can use that to our advantage in our house plants as well um if it's just like a one smaller plant uh, our nutrition folks have played with a whole bunch of different light setups that they got um, just ordered off of Amazon that we've been trying in different classrooms. And the favorite one that the teachers and our nutrition folks seem to like the best is a little, it's on a little platform and it's, it's an LED based light that has like three strings that come out or not strings, they're harder, but they're flexible. So you have like three lights that you can bend down over close to the plant. And then when the plant gets bigger, you can pull it up. And so they're movable to like really be close to the light. And they seem to really like that one the best um, because it was flexible if you're just doing it for a small plant, right? Um, and then there's any manner of different setups you can get like with fluorescent tubes and, and that type of stuff. The setups from those might range from like 50 bucks up to 150, depending on how many bulbs and how much brightness you wanna put like in a four foot space. So that's when you start, that's a bit much for like in the house. So some of these ones like you find on Amazon that um, are flexible or maybe even have a little bit of style to them might work better for the house. It might be worthwhile to take a look at some of the ones that are out there so you can just show people like what, what, what some options are so they can figure out what works for their situation. Because some of that depends on what their space is too, or are they renting? Like, can they drill some holes in the ceiling and plant and put an overhead? light fixture in, maybe they can't. So there's options for all of those. Nancy has asked a question that, uh, interesting. Uh, I have heard that honey is a good rooting hormone. Haven't tried it. Have you heard of it? <laughs> I did try it once in the South and the ants loved it. I haven't tried it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. There was, yes, the ants found them all and it was a big mess. So that was my experience with it. That might not be the case here. Okay, everyone, the floor is open for your questions. I would suggest uh, sending them in on the chat and uh, Nicole can answer them as they come in. I really appreciate you all having me. I hope that this has been helpful for you and given you some um, food for thought in terms of guiding people through their choices for houseplants. 
<laughs> no, it's great. It's uh, nice how you categorize these things. Um, I, I know I learned a lot. I'm, I'm not a house plant person. I leave that to my wife, but uh, it's been interesting to hear about all of these different kinds of things that I see them growing around the house, but I know nothing about them myself. <laughs> All right, well, I don't see any other questions, but again, I appreciate you all so much for joining me on a Monday night, and um, I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you so much. Nicole, thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. It was great. I know we had a few late arrivals in the program, and I'll remind everyone that if you go to the bentonmg.org website, uh, in a few days, uh, Nicole's talk in its entirety will be available on the website. So, Nicole, thank you again. Coming to us from so far away through the miracle of the internet. <laughs> all right, you all have a great night. Thanks again.